All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to put up the screensaver that some of you have seen, uh, just for the people who are watching this later uh, on, uh, you know, YouTube or something. So I'm just going to bring it up for a second because it, it's uh, where we start off. It's, uh, those of you who've been in uh, Loose Leaf Hollow, um, it's uh, a little corner of a larger uh, a painting that's a copy of a, a Gauguin. Uh, and uh, today's talk, you could, uh, I don't know, you could title it uh, Three Questions and Four Remembrances. Uh, and uh, the three questions, uh, we're uh, up in the corner of the painting. Uh, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Uh, it's hard to get better uh, questions for the spiritual journey than those three questions. And Gauguin, that, that was one of his last uh, journal entries when he was out on Tahiti. And uh, it made its way onto this painting, uh, which was done by a local artist here. It's one of the oldest. Uh, <laughs> donations to the wall space and loosely follows this large painting of uh, uh, Gauguin's. And those questions, uh, they're just sitting there all the time. They've been there for 20 years, really. And I've been uh, sitting with them for 20 years. Where do we come from? What are we? Uh, where are we going? Those are great questions. And we'll start with those three questions. And uh, so I'm going to turn the screensaver off hopefully you got a good look at it uh, you can look up that picture sometime to see the whole picture if you or come to loosely follow sometime there we go back with uh, the group um where do we come from what are we where are we going well these questions have been around for a while probably as long as human beings have been around and uh i'm gonna uh take a, a, you know, go back to the 19th century to uh, Wordsworth, who took a swing at these questions. And I'm going to just give you just a little, a uh, um, uh, few lines from uh, his great poem, which was called uh, Ode on Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. Wordsworth was a real nature mystic in the 19th century, you know, walking around the lake country in England. And uh, here, here's a few lines that, you know, in, in such a compact place, he, he, he gave his answer for all three. And then we're gonna jump off that, do a little exploration together in our time. And, uh, and then um, break open a, a poem that's in the current collection of um, uh, The Cave of the Heart. So here's a few lines from Wordsworth. Uh, in response to these questions, really, where do we come from? What are we? And uh, where are we going? Richard said, uh, he wrote, our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath has hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Yeah, Ode on uh, Intimations of Immortality. If you wanna look at the whole poem, it's really worth it, but that's the core of it. He answers those three questions, at least he gives, uh, he gives his answer anyway. Ode on intimata Intimations of uh, immortality. So uh, I'd like to start with the middle part, because he, he, he says, well, we're a soul. And, uh, you know, 
where do we come from? We come from God. It's the last line. God is our home. God is where we come from. And what are we? We're a soul. Okay. And where are we going? That's a, that's a good question. Where does this thing go? It's, Wordsworth was not of the opinion that this was just our only rodeo. We, we came in trailing clouds of glory, as he said. So not other, we don't come in utter forgetfulness. So we come in trailing clouds of glory that are soon forgotten. There's a classic story, I, I think, uh, uh, Matthew Kelty at the monastery, he read it in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, uh, it was a little feature article, supposedly a true story, but it, it's true whether it happened or not. It's really true. And uh, a couple, a couple of lawyers, I think they lived in Seattle and uh, they had uh, a couple of children. The first one, uh, little Jimmy was kind of an ADDH kind of hell on wheels kind of guy. And then uh, five or six years later, they gave birth to a little girl, Grace. And um, uh, they had, uh, it was the era of they had baby monitors in the room and a couple of lawyers were out there reading something in the living room and the, and then they heard the door open on Grace's room and they noticed little Jimmy had was gone so they figured oh he's coming in and they were a little worried because he always tried to pick up the baby and uh, they were always afraid he was going to drop her so they were ready to get up but then they heard on the baby monitor they said Grace Grace What's God like? I'm forgetting. You know, whether it actually happened or not, and you know, maybe it did. It was reported as happened to these, uh, but you know, it's this little five or six year old act asking the newborn who, you know, maybe still sees some of those clouds of glory trailing behind you. Know, grace, Grace, what's God like? I'm forgetting. Where do we come from? Where are we going? So it's a deep story, I think. Okay. Well, then what are we? You know, stuck right in the middle of it. You know, where do we come from? This is a question of origin, which all the myths of going all the way back to maybe the first uh, uh, myth coming from the Central Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, they're their origin stories. And, uh, and where are we going? Well, those are, you know, visionary stories. It says in the Psalms, and I think it's true, one great line in the Psalms is, uh, without a vision, the people perish. And man, that's really true. It's not, not true just for, you know, a bunch of people like a tribe or a country, like a nation like we have now, but it's, it's true for a human being, you know, uh, just you and me. Without a vision, we sort of start to die on the vine. We need to have a sense of where we're going. You know, other than, you know, you can have this thing of, well, hell, it doesn't make much difference. It's all random. And, you know, when we die, we die. And that's it. Lights out. Well, that, that could be your vision. See how it works. <laughs> but uh, it, it wouldn't quite suit for me. It didn't suit for Wordsworth. You know, God is our home, you know, and uh, we, we leave home. All of us left our home, our home, our, you know, the home where we were born, and we, we were set on a pilgrimage. Where are we going? Well, we're going to find our true home. Uh, you can't go home again, as Thomas Wolfe said. That means you can't go back to your place of, uh, of uh, birth and this thing. But, you know, Jesus tried it. It didn't work out great for him. They tried to throw him off a cliff you know, near, near escape. So you can't go home again in a way. Uh, but we're looking for home for sure. Now that middle thing I want to spend a little time on and then we'll, uh, then we'll work with a poem from the new collection. By the way, I'm almost out of the first run of uh, The Cave of the Heart, the new book of poems. So, uh, and I ordered a second run. So if you, if you don't have it yet uh, and you want it, uh, 50 poems this is from the last four years, 50 poems that are still alive for me. You know, you write, I write poems every day and, you know, they expire in a, in a given day or a week or something, but these 50 are still alive. So, you know, I just put them down. 
just put them down and then hand them out to people if they want them. Maybe, maybe one of them makes your day or wakes you up one day, you know, who, who knows, but they're, they're available. So just, you can just text me your name and address of uh, send an email. And uh, as soon as I get some more in, I'll send them out. Um, but you know, what are we? Well, uh, Wordsworth says we are a soul which is we're going to have to we're going to have to explore that a little bit because you know modern materialist culture it started with the enlightenment and industrial revolution and all that we we've lost touch with the sense of soul maybe you you, you know you know you think of soul in terms of music and or, or uh, just sort of generic you know, idea you know he, he has soul or she has soul but what what does it really mean uh, I remember, you know, I taught 30 years in the classroom with 10 years with 16 year olds, primarily 17 year olds. And then the last 20 years with 12 and 13 year olds, you know, every year, 150 of them, five classes, you know, of 25 or 30 come by, you know, I had one, one family here in Bardstown who uh, they had seven kids year after year, a good Irish Catholic family, boom, boom, boom. I taught all seven of them in the, t in the 20 years. And, um, and I gotta tell you, they were very different souls. I mean, I had, you know, they were all over the map in terms of soul quality. Uh, the, probably the ripest uh, student that I had in my 30 years was part of that family an old soul, if you know that term. Old school soul means somebody that's been around, had, had many rodeos here, see? The Dalai Lama, old soul. Merton was born an old soul. And you know, even if I hadn't studied to, with the Tibetans, because they are the guys who say, you know, I said, there are more than one rodeo. You got more than, you got more than 4,000 weeks. And you know, so I saw in this one family, even if I hadn't read Tibetan, you could see the same environment, basically seven year span, didn't change that much, but same genes, same two parents. But man, there was one of them was like green as the greenest apple, was, in the, was far from ripeness. And then this one guy uh, was amazing. An old soul in a 13 year old. And you know, you've met these kinds of people. You might be these kinds of people. Chances are, you know, why would you be here? The chances are pretty good that uh, you've ripened on the vine a bit. How many lifetimes? Dalai Lama, 14 times around? I don't know. Uh, this feels older than 72 years to me. A lot, of, a lot of the baggage seems older than 72 years. So when you're talking about a soul, uh, that we are souls. Uh, this was a, a world of difference from what I learned with my good Dominican sisters growing up, that 12 years of Dominicans. And it was very clear we had a soul. And uh, uh, that's different than being a soul right away to get that difference that you are a soul from, uh, from Wordsworth's point of view, from the contemplative traditions, they have different names for it. Uh, Tibetan, it's a different name. They don't use the, the, the English word soul, but they, they, they're, they're the Buddhists who say, you know, there is this thing that goes on. And uh, uh, well, if you had a soul in the 1950s Catholic schools, it was sort of like a spiritual report card. You guys might know the territory. And uh, all your merits and demerits were marked on it inevitably. And, uh, you know, when you died, uh, one of the interesting questions we used to ask this is how long does the soul remain with the body before it takes off to go to the principal's office to be evaluated, you know, which was sort of terrifying. And then based on the merits and demerits, you either uh, graduated to life on the playground for the rest of your life, or then you went to detention for the rest of your life, sort of scary uh, setup. But that was really what we thought of the soul at that time. And you know, that went sort of out the window by the time you get to college because it's just too small. It's what we were talking about last week with the Cave of the Heart, it was just too small as you grew to, uh, to take seriously. But so we threw the whole idea of many of us of God and religion and the soul, we just threw it all out together. And uh, well, 
chances are you're ready to revisit this if you're here at all. If you're looking for, you know, something, something, uh, you're looking for what you long for. So if we're a soul, let's break this down a little bit in an adult way based on the, the metaphors we've been using for those of you who've been here for, many of you here I'm looking at uh, that I'm, that's here today have been on together for over two years talking about these things. Well, the, the soul is, it, it, it's what we are. Let's just take that premise that we don't have a soul. You know, you have a car, you have a computer, but you are a soul is a different ballgame entirely. That you are this um, manifestation of the spirit. It's again, the Sufi parable of the ocean and the waves. The ocean is the one spirit. Uh, and then every wave, billions of waves that come out. You know, we say there's five or six or seven oceans on the planet. That's nonsense. There's one body of water. We're a water planet, primarily 70%. You know, the, how the rational minds will divide it up and put boundaries, just like, you know, states, nations. But that's nonsense. There's one spirit, but then there's trillions, you know, the one and the many, as the, the cultures talk about Taoism, they talk about the Tao and then the 10,000 things. So there's the one and the many. And so if, if human beings, uh, each of us is a unique kind of waveform of this one ocean of the spirit. Okay, so that gives you a basic view. But now to actually look into what is this waveform like as a human being? Well, uh, you know, it's hard to get away from the Trinity. And uh, even brain science guys who are you know looking into the brain as we've started to do. You know, we talk about the triune brain, the brain stem, which has sort of basic uh, lizard-like uh, survival kinds of, uh, you know, fight or flight stuff. And then, then we have these two halves of brain, uh, left brain, right brain, the triune brain they talk about. Okay, well, now the soul, uh, surprise, it shouldn't surprise you, is, is a kind of Trinitarian dance too. It's a kind of triune being uh, entity, and uh, I would I would say just basically it's a, it's it's the intelligence of the body, it's the intelligence of the mind, and it's the intelligence of the heart. These are levels of consciousness. Okay, and we've been working with these. I, I call them operating systems because I think we can understand that. Uh, first operating system uh, of the soul is the operating system of of the body, uh, it's uh, the survival operating system. It works on sensation and emotion. <laughs> well, you needed to get food to survive. If the mom was, you know, watching the soap opera or something, you start crying. You know, hey, what about me? You didn't have words. You know, I didn't have email. You just you would cry. So that's our first operating system. It's sensational in the sense of it. It's it, it, the senses are in play. And, uh, but then we also have emotions. When, when, we're, when we're hungry, we cry. When we, you know, we have a load in our diaper, we cry because that's the only way we can get mom's attention or dad's attention or our siblings. So it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's sensation, it's emotion. It's sort of aerobic. Uh, that's a, 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 a Ken Wilber word, which they have the image of a, a, sta a snake bite biting its own tail. And then, so it's a sense of, you know, it is a kind of unity. We don't really even know we're separate at first from these other beings whirling around us. Uh, we don't even know we're separate from bomb for a long time. We don't, we, we wouldn't really call it, uh, uh, we're not even persons yet. We're, it's a pre-personal stage of consciousness. And we're, we're just basically on this survival, stay away from pain, feed me, feed me, feed me. And that's all right. You know, we, it's amazing. We come built in with three operating systems and we can upgrade. Well, we, if, we, if we survive, well, given we all did, here we are, then we actually could work that program pretty good. We got fed. And then, you know, we start to separate a little bit. 
at the around the age of two or three, you know, no, me do it. I don't want you feeding me. I'm doing it. The terrible twos or threes, you know, the terrible twos go on for a few years, as some of you parents know this. And uh, you can get stuck at it. You could, you could be a president of the United States in that mode. It's possible, you know, where you just, ah. So uh, the next the thing that upgrades is we go from the, we got the sensory program on and the emotional program, then we can go into the intellect and that's you go to school. Yeah, you, you get you 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 have words now. This is all very fluid. It's not you know you develop da da mama and whatever, and you'd start that left brain is starting to be able to form words for objects. And then school, you educate the intellect, uh, and that's uh, the, the strategic operating system. I mean, survival operating system is pretty basic. Get food, eat food, you know. Uh, stay away from danger. But the strategic operating system, which is the left brain, which is the mind, the words, thought, intellect, now you can actually, you do become a person in the sense of uh, an individual. And, and you, in some sense, somewhere along the line, you get the sense of, I'm here and there's all these others. So that's that sense of separation comes from, you know, in mythological terms, the Jewish myth, it was, you know, when you ate the, the knowledge of the tree of opposites, good and evil, all of a sudden we all wake up. I mean, I taught junior high. It was like the battleground of this. Kids woke up. They were self-conscious. That means they had a self. No baby and no, no little toddlers are self-conscious. They're really not a self. They haven't really developed that yet. So with the second operating system, which gives us a lot more power, and strategic power, we can get what we want, you know, crying, you know, you know, so we can use words, we can think through things. That's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So we upgrade, we still have the emotions, we still have the physical stuff, but we upgrade. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a higher level of consciousness. Okay. And those two together, you know, where the, the, uh, the survival operating system is reactive. You know, pain, pleasure, it's basically reactive. That's what it has to be. Now, when you get into strategic operating system, which we start to learn in school, language, logic, reason, intellect, uh, that's transactional, okay? Uh, you can tra make, make more sophisticated transactions. I'll give you this, you give me that, okay? Again, words worth talking about. This is, this is a, it's a step up, but uh, if you live your whole life at that level in the mind, the mind's a beautiful thing, but if that's all you got is those first two operating systems, Wordsworth has this, he says, the world is too much with us. This is where we get this idea of the, there's the world out there and there's us. And we're trying to get what we need from the, the wider world, our family, our, the, the kids in school, the group, planet the world is too much with us uh, getting and spending we lay waste our powers he's talking about when you live life at the transactional level of consciousness the world is too much with us getting and spending there it is the transactional in three words getting and spending and, and we lay waste our powers you can spend your whole life getting and spending that would be a pretty good uh, definition of uh, consumer culture, wouldn't it? And you know, whoever dies with the most toys wins. You know, that's that's the vision of some people. And uh, you know, try it on for size. It hasn't worked so well for the rich and famous, but uh, that's that's it. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Well, luckily, everybody, and I mean everybody, comes with this third operating system. Uh, I call it the sacred operating system. So we got survival operating system, strategic, but then the sacred operating system, which is in contemplative uh, uh, parlance, goes to the heart. Buddhism, talk about the awakened heart, the bodhicitta. Uh, Catholics, uh, especially, talk about the sacred heart. Okay. You know, and, and you know, in the icons, only Jesus and Mary have this thing. I was jealous of that in early on in life. I say, how come these guys got this? Well, the point is, we all have it. 
That was a misinterpretation. We all have this third operating system uh, of the heart. Now, how is it different? Uh, it doesn't divide the world like the strategic mind. You know, the strategy comes from divide. You know, you know, you, you, a table is not a chair. You know, um, a gun is not, you know, uh, a blanket. You know, you, so you can, you can, you, you divide, you, you know, one thing is not like the other. That's what the left brain does. And it has great strategic value for dealing with time and space. How do you, how do you deal with mortality? <laughs> the left brain is not great for that. How do you deal with aging? How do you deal even with a relationship with anybody? Because it's all relationship. You know, we're looking for, I started out looking for truth or looking for enlightenment, to, you know, 50 years ago. I didn't know what I was looking for. I was looking for what I didn't know I had, whatever that was. But, uh, you know, it's, it's quantum physics. And also the deep contemplatives, they say it's all relationship. The truth is relationship. What we're looking for is to feel not lonely on this planet, you see. And, uh, and to, to try to, to be in relationship with even one other person, with your husband, your wife, your partner, your, your kids, or even you name it, uh, working from this, I'm here and you're there kind of thing. You're always playing chess. You're always, it's, that chess is the ultimate strategic game, you see. And uh, I played chess with my wife for the first 10 years and I won every game and lost the marriage first time. A little slow to recognize that, but that's, that's really what it is. It's, it's horrible for a relationship, for a relationship with the transcendent, with the transpersonal. See, we're, we're, we're pre-personal. Then we, we, can't, we have a person, we have a self, and then but, but how do you relate to the thing that's greater than the personal, the transpersonal, the divine, whatever you want to call it? The, uh, the first two operating systems don't do. So you have to bring on this uh, next operating system, the operating system of the heart. Now, how does it operate? It operates um, holistically, first of all. It doesn't divide, it operates from holes, it sees holes, uh, it doesn't see division, and it doesn't operate by logic, it operates by resonance. Resonance, and this is an interesting word, resonance, because resonance means to resound. See, and so it, it's more like a vibrational kind of thing. It, it reads vibrational levels, it reads it reads in a sense of uh, as uh, resonance, and the ultimate thing with the uh, the heart operating system, it, it will align you with reality. Suffering is being out of alignment with reality, which you you know you how smart you are. The, the 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 more intellectual you are, the you know could could make it the worst to where you're totally ah uh, you're living in a world of and uh, reality is reality. Yes, Elliot said between the idea, between the idea, idea, and the reality falls the shadow. Between the idea and the reality falls the shadow, uh, which is why when we uh, when we come to uh, meditation or formal contemplation, we have to leave these first two operating systems behind. The operating system of the senses, so we. We sit still and, and shut our eyes. Jesus said his only really cue on this was he said, uh, um, go into your, your room and shut the on the world and then and, uh, uh, relate to God in secret, in silence, you see, in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, the shutting the door, we shut our eyes. And we sit in silence, so we're, we're stopping movement. So we're, we're really sort of leaving uh, much of the, the sensory world behind. And then, you know, this laying aside of thoughts that's in all the traditions, these thoughts that are going, we, 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 we practice just sort of laying aside thoughts because we know thoughts can't get us there. We cannot relate to personal to this uh, you know, 
we have all the names for it, but we can't re relate to that via the intellect. So senses and intellect can't do it. They're not bad, but we leave them aside for a while while we practice this thing, which is just, you know, and the Benedictines they have the, the best, they say you're listening with the ear of the heart in the silence. So then we add silence in turn. So we're stillness, silence, listening with the ear of the heart. And uh, so thoughts aren't bad, they're, they're important, you know? Uh, it's important to think really hard about things. How do you sustain a democracy? How do you keep a roof over your head? This takes thought, nothing wrong with it. But when you're trying to, the only way you bring another, you update to another operating system is to just to, to practice it. And so when we practice this, and those other two operating systems aside, they're still running. I mean, your body is circulating blood, you're breathing and all that. You're really not blocking it. And we're trying to listen deeply with the ear and the heart. Okay. Yeah. And so that's that's really, and that's that's what we have to develop to be able to deal with um, anything uh, of the trans person. So uh, the uh, the last uh, uh, last poem in the book. It's last because, uh, you know, I start with it every morning and it's very important to me. So I'm gonna read it a couple of times and we'll just uh, add it into the, uh, it's called The Four Remembrances. Uh, it's easy to find because it's the last book. It's like 102 or something like that, uh, but the 50th poem. And I recite this uh, a poem every morning uh, before I sit. Because again, you know, what, what Wordsworth was saying is, you know, all too soon we forget everything. I, I, I use the term all the time, you know, that we're really not homo sapiens, we're homo amnesians. <laughs> and we can forget everything, including, uh, you know, where we come from, what we are and where we're going. You know, all of a sudden we're just, we're in the world and we're, we're, just, we're doing all these other things. And so I try to remember these four things every morning before I sit and then I sit and sort of you know, you can sit and, and, and just totally forget even what you're doing with a, a, trying to do a meditation. So first it starts out, uh, it's called the Four Remembrances. It said, today we remember that for all eternity, in every situation, in wealth or poverty, sickness or health, happiness or difficulty, from rain or from shine, we will bless each other, both now and forever. It's the first thing we remember. And it's, uh, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to all of them. I'll just read it straight. Today, we remember that the essence of our relationship was, is, and always will be dwelling in the cave of the heart. Today, we remember that this dwelling will ripen us inevitably to become transpersonal hotspots, radiating the energy of love and, and transformation to one and all. Today, we remember that the prayer of the cosmos, both now and forever, is simply this, I am, may we be. Let's just uh, open this up a little bit. The first remembrance, today we remember that for all eternity, in every situation, in wealth or poverty, sickness or health, happiness or difficulty, come rain or come shine, we will bless each other both now and forever. So the first remembrance is, first of all, takes in eternity, for all eternity in every situation. And then, you know, those are the opposites there. You know, maybe you're rich, maybe you're poor tomorrow, maybe you're sick, maybe you're healthy. There's, there's several people in the community that are ailing right now. Uh, I've dedicated this session myself to those people who are ailing uh, or trying to recover from an illness. 
you know, one day you're healthy, the next day you're, you know, one day you're happy, and the next day it's diff, you're, things are difficult. Come rain or come shine, uh, we will bless each other, both now and forever. The first remembrance is maybe the most important that what are you here for? And what are you doing with the day? Are you blessing somebody? How can you bless somebody? What are your unique ways of blessing every situation and every person you meet? That's the first thing. And that's, that comes from my uh, just experience, but also my uh, rendering of the first line of the, of the Aramaic uh, Lord's Prayer. Oh, beloved one, your oceanic womb births infinite blessing in waves of darkness and light. We are those waves of blessing, every one of us. And um, we're unique in the ways we can bless people and situations. I don't know what you're living for, but that's what I'm living for. I'm aware of that more and more that in the time that I have left, uh, I'm blessing. What if the world uh, just stopped for 45 minutes <laughs> and everybody blessed everything they could see? <laughs> Be a revolution. Today, we remember that the essence of our relationship was, is, and always will be dwelling in the cave of the heart. Um, that's an image. That's why the, the collection is called the cave of the heart, because it's become a very deep image for me. Uh, it's that, the, again, the cave, it was the first place where human beings all over the planet, uh, in all cultures, all continents, except for Antarctica, uh, they went down, down into the, the darkness of the earth to do sacred work. They put their, there was the first time that we know of that they put something from the inside on the outside surface of the wall, the cave wall. Uh, that was a sacred act. Uh, print and words, now it's, it's we're, we're, we're drowning in it. It doesn't mean much, but back then, even before we had words, they were taking images from a dream, perhaps, or a vision, and they were putting it on the cave wall. Okay, well, that's where we go in meditation. And to say that, uh, the essence of relationship is found there in your very depths of your heart. I think it's true. Only the heart can relate, not transactionally, to have a real relationship, not be separate and trying to get what you want. It's, there's part of that. We all do that. You have to go to Walmart every once in a while and buy something, you know, go to the store. But to, be, you know, to actually have a relationship with even a single person with your kids, with a community. It's got to come from the heart. As blessing comes from the heart, what we talked about in the first remembrance, uh, we were raised to believe blessings came from up there or something. They do not, not in my experience. They come from the depths of the heart and they, they go out. That's what and we're meant to, we receive them there, you know, that this, community that's grown up in the last couple of years in a heartbreaking time called heart to heart. That's what the cave of the heart is. It's the place where the human heart can meet the sacred heart, the heart of the transpersonal in the cave of the heart. Caves are dark. Caves are silent. I've been in mammoth cave when they switch off all the lights and uh, a, you cannot see the hand in front of your face and B, you can hear everything. So the, the caves are places, uh, you hear your heartbeat as John said last uh, week in his amazing sharing about being stuck in the crevice, being pulled out by his buddies. That's what we're all doing to each other. But this idea of silence and uh, stillness to where we can really listen um, to the uh, now, what is, you know, today we're, 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 we're going four down four times into the cave you know, for 80 minutes going into the cave. The third remembrance is uh, 
today we remember that the dwelling, this dwelling, this work we're doing of going down into the cave, this dwelling will ripen us inevitably. That's the point. How long, how many lifetimes, nobody knows. Nobody knows. But it's, it's the work, this work, this going down into the darkness, into the silence, and just being there, being present, open, and available during formal sitting. This, this dwelling in the cave of the heart will ripen us inevitably to become what I call transpersonal hotspots. Uh, you got a hotspot on your phone that you can, you can connect to the internet even when you do, you're not in your house or anything. Well, that's what's in the heart. It's a transpersonal hotspot. Uh, we become that. Eventually, how many lifetimes? I don't know. This lifetime, it would be nice. The sooner the better, because then you can, what does a transpersonal hotspot do? It radiates the energy of love and transformation to one and all. What are you longing for? Love and transformation, uh, that energy. I think that's what the Christ is. That's what the Tao is. That's what Allah is. That's what uh, any of these names for the transpersonal, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's cosmic. It's an energy. It's the energy that moves the sun and all the stars, according to Dante, which I image I like. There's an energy here. And certain individuals have actually really trans, they were transpersonal hotspots. Buddha, Jesus, these are guys whose their energy is still out there. That's what the Christ is to me. It's the energy of love and uh, transformation. So powerful. It is going to transform you. And then you do that for other people. It's not bad for a vision. And then finally, uh, today we remember that the prayer of the cosmos, of the cosmos itself, the prayer of the whole shebang, both now and forever, is simply this. I am. Uh, may we be. That's a very interesting, you know, when Moses uh, was at the burning bush uh, and he, he said, you know, he had this experience. First of all, he had to take off his shoes. <laughs> uh, you can't bring uh, accoutrements into this meeting. He took off his shoes. And, uh, and, and that, that's the image of you're taking off, you're leaving the thoughts. And, and he even said, who are you? He wanted a name. And uh, the transpersonal said, uh, actually, in, in the Hebrew, it just said, am, being itself, the word for being itself, what Tillich called the ground of being, the ground you're standing on. You take off your shoes to be standing on the earth, you see, not to have anything between you and what you're actually standing on, you see, to be in touch. And uh, he said, you know, it'd be, you know, I am who am is what the translation comes through in English, but really just said, pure being, I am. And then the prayer of the cosmos is that we be, in other words, that we all experience this being and that we all, uh, the we is so important that we all realize that you can't kill anybody. There are no enemies. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all these waves. We're all emanations of the basic cosmos itself. So it's quite a big vision. If you want a vision, uh, the contemplatives have it. Yeah. So I try to remind myself of that. It's so easy to forget any part of that for me so that's one of the things i recite every day before i said i recited it today before we sat in, in, inside of course um, i'm not trying to get in your way on that well, all right i think that's enough well we'll just uh take some time we'll have 15 minutes before we uh come back to to do another couple dives into the cave so uh just go back into the uh Silence in the 24-7 uh, practice of mindfulness in the meantime. 